Oh, good day, good day, good day. Welcome to our coffee and conversation. My name is Karen, and I'm one of your recovery coaches. Good morning. My name is Michael, also one of your recovery coaches. Welcome. And as always, I'm Craig, one of your recovery coaches here at Capital Recovery Center. Don't forget that, all right? Don't forget, Craig. <laughs> nah. Good morning, everyone. So just a couple announcements before we begin. Um, just a reminder, our Recovery on Wheels will be out this Thursday. Um, is it this Thursday? No, this Wednesday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow at the mini park across from the City Liquor in Millville. Nice. And it's on your screen, guys. So you can also, uh, if you need any information in regards to recovery, uh, or if you're uh, in need of any Narcan, you can come out there and receive the uh, brief training that I will give you and some more information in regards to um, how to administer the Narcan and things like that. Any other issue, situations that you might want to come to the Recovery on Wheels for, please feel free to come out and um, see what we do. Absolutely. So as you can see, uh, well, there you go. <laughs> it's an Espanol. Oh, so for those who in our community who speak Spanish or read Spanish, it's right up there on our screen. And that way you can be able to participate as well. What other announcements we got? The recovery walk on Friday, 11 o'clock. You can come to 72 North Pearl Street and meet us here. We'll be going to walk around the um, downtown at the if it's downtown at the zoo. Uh, we do a walk for recovery all month of September. We're doing a virtual recovery walk. Uh, you can also participate in that if you would like to participate in that and you walk um, uh, regularly or just want to support recovery. Then say something in the comment section and I'll send you the link or something that you can be a part of it on our team or you can uh, create your own team. It's up to you. And all month we're celebrating someone on the spotlight. That's right. That's right. Spotlight recovery. Every month, every first Friday of the month, we pick someone to spotlight who has been successful in their recovery process. This particular month was very special because we was able to spotlight Miss Melissa Niles, who is our boss and director in human services. And um, it was also an honor to be able to spotlight her and all of her dedication and success in the recovery field and, and in all the stuff that she does in the area of helping other individuals in the same field of uh, substance use disorder and mental health and all of those things. All right. That is so inspiring. Yeah, it is. You know, uh, for all of us who are in recovery, just to know that we have someone that has achieved so much um, during her lifespan and uh, she's a very prime example that we all can uh, make a difference if we uh, stick with our recovery. So, yeah. The journey. That's right. The long Listen journey. Listen and take our hats off to her. And so I hope someone is inspired just to know that, hey, listen, you could be a director of human service or director of some department one day. That's right. You know, it's not too late to change directions of your the course of your life, anywhere but backwards. Mm -hmm. Well, today we have every week we find different topics that we can to try to elaborate on, and we give you our own personal experience in each of the things that we do. Today we're going to talk about the most serious effects of drug addiction on family members, uh, which is something that get overlooked a lot. Me personally, I will always say that I wasn't hurting anybody but me when I was really destroying everybody who was next to me. <laughs> so uh, this is a very good uh, subject to discuss. We got this particular handout from the website called discoverynj.org. Uh, the link to this particular handout is actually in the description of this particular live video, and you'll be able to get the link and get the material for yourself. Um, most of the places that we get things from, we read on our own edification and we use it to edify other individuals as well. We can, you can do the same thing. So today we're going to talk about some of the serious effects that it has on the families, the family members, which get overlooked a lot. I believe uh, if I had to put a percentage on it, I'll be in the 90s to say, because I am 
speaking from my own personal experience of 22 years of struggling with heroin and crack cocaine, uh, in order for me to have done it, my mentor taught me this, in order for me to have done that for 22 years, you had to be selfless. And that means that you didn't care anything about your family, your kids, or nothing. In order for you to do that for that amount of time, you had to be selfish. And I never looked at that in that sense. But uh, anybody that uh, continuing to do something, no matter if you say uh, the reason why you do it is this, the reason why you do it because of the devil, the reason why you do it because of disease, whatever reason you have, it still associate with being very selfish to some degree. I just want to say that it's ironic that the first thing a person says when they're trying to get treatment is, what about my family? I don't want to leave my family behind. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's just funny because at that moment, you don't realize how selfish you have been. And now it's like you're being unselfish by getting, you know, yeah. getting treatment or, or seeking help. And you're concerned about your family. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, it is. That's actually uh, something that clicks in uh, to try to seem like the family was important. But in all honesty, uh, I can remember days when my own child was sick and I had the money, or her mother gave me the money to get the medicine. And I used the medicine, money to get heroin, knowing that my own daughter was sick. You know, and then I would turn around and say, oh, man, I love my daughter. <laughs> not, not that day, you know. <laughs> you know, but that's why it's so important to <clears throat> focus on the effects that has on the family. So let's get started. You want me to read it? Oh, you good. I'm good. Yeah. All right. In their, in their lifetime, more than 21 million Americans ages 12 and older have had a substance use problem. Wow which includes alcohol and drug addiction. Addiction is a disease that affects not only an individual psychologically, psychological well-being, but their physiological, emotional states as well. Much has been written about the negative impacts of addiction on the user. As much as the substance use disorder can affect the user, it is emotionally, it can emotionally impact his or her family even more. Addiction in the family has a unique relationship that isn't often seen by the substance abuser. This article will discuss how substance abuse affects the family. We're talking about family. One of the things in the terminology in the treatment side, this facility, Capital Recovery Center, doesn't deal with treatment. But in the treatment side, as the other uh, part of our uh, organization, um, one of the things that I used to try to encourage my clients to um, participate in or get their families to participate in was family therapy. Because I, being a person that comes out of that type of lifestyle and living a different lifestyle, I know how important the family dynamic plays a part in the recovery process. So I would try to encourage individuals, you should try to see if you have a family session. And they'd be like, it's not happening right now. <laughs> But I still would mention it to give them the opportunity to try to coordinate uh, a family session. It's like really very important. The relationship between drug and addiction, addic drug addiction and family members. When a family is trying to cope with a loved one who is struggling with an addiction, they tend to experience intense and conflicting emotions that can take a significant toll even on the strongest of relationships. This is right. The person struggling with a substance use disorder family understands their loved one isn't trying to cause problems or hurt them intentionally. This emphasis, this empathy makes them want to provide him or her with support, love, and encouragement. That's very important, too. It says that, you know, because they know that the person is under those particular influence, it's not intentional. But they still want to try to be there and have empathy for them and, and show love and support. On the other hand, the manipulation, deceit, and other forms of emotional abuse that a person struggling with a substance use disorder throws their way daily is a cause of pain and frustration in the family. As a result, these negative emotions manifest themselves in unhealthy ways and may cause a strain in family ties. 
So the following are some of the most serious ways. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just six serious ways that we're going to cover. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about uh, some of the manipulation and the deceitful, uh, <clears throat> some of the things that we as uh, those who are in their uh, substance use disorder stage often find themselves uh, taking on what we call stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. And that is, you know, we are very cunning, you know, just to get, you know, what we want. We want what we want when we want it, you know, regardless of who it hurts. Yeah, and so I think the real value or the real meat of this article is basically to try to get a draw emphasis on the holistic aspect. Yeah. A lot of times we deal with the individual and uh, now we're going to talk about the family. That's right. And so Mike has been reading on <coughs> he has been elaborating, him and Karen. And so we're going to do number one. I'll read the first one if that's all right. All right. Impact on children. Study shows that one in five children grow up with a parent who abuses drugs or alcohol. If a parent is battling, battling an addiction or substance abuse problem, the effects of that disorder are more than likely going to play a role in the child's development. This is especially serious in single parent households right. where the children have no one else to turn to. Let's talk about <coughs> that. Let's do it. You know, it, it's, you know, it's often said that the first lesson people learn or children learn is at the home. And so when you have a child who, who growing up in a household with their parents uh, on the use of drugs. And so it, it displays in several different ways in children's behavior, yep. now how they uh, interact with other children uh, in the community, also in school, and also when they develop. And so it's very sad when there's no role model and then people say, wow, these children do now they, we have to look at where it comes from, you know? If the parent is uh, being affected, the child is being affected, all right? When a parent has an addiction, they're too busy looking for and using their substance of choice, which distracts them from their responsibilities. As a result, they won't meet the needs of their child. This irresponsibility ranges from not taking care of basic needs, such as providing meals and keeping the child clean to secondary needs like ensuring their child is getting an education and social life. Uh -huh. And so I didn't even read that part in now. Uh, you said it. You know, because it's real. It's real. And then we know it, we know it all too often in our community. And it's like, you know, uh, it's almost common uh, nature, you know, when we read stuff like this, because it's, it happens so, so much in our community. All right. More. There is a correlation between substance use disorder or addiction and an increased risk of child abuse. Research has revealed that abused children have a higher chance of getting into substance use and addiction later in life. Even if the child doesn't end up abusing substances, growing up in such an environment with, will compromise their emotional and mental health. This will impact their self-confidence, health, and social development. That's good stuff. Social skills. <clears throat> impact on children. And he just was talking about the impact it has on children. And I always associate that with my own personal, uh, my sibling. Uh, my mother had her own personal issues with alcohol. My father had his issues with uh, drugs. However, as growing up around it, my way of processing it was, if my parents could do it, I can do it. I thought that that means I can party all night like they do. So that's how I process. My other siblings process the opposite. They did that. We're not doing it. So it's awesome. So you might, uh, the effect that it has, impact it has on children can vary depending upon how each child process what they see. <laughs> so it don't just think, you know, if they're, uh, uh, it depends on how that child is processing it. They sit back from afar. Uh, if, for instance, if a child see a mother getting beat or a father being beat, whichever way it goes, they might process it like I can do that to my uh, person. 
And then some children might process it like, I'm never going to do that. You know what I mean? It depends on the impact on the child. It very, it depends on how the child process what they're going through, so what they're saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how they perceive it. How they perceive it. Because imagery is so important, especially when uh, developing minds. So some developing. Developing minds are so impressionative. So a lot of times it's like a sponge. And so they absorb so much information. So, but if they're not able to uh, dissect what is right and what is wrong, or then talk what right is wrong, like I did, easily right confusing. <laughs> exactly. I thought it meant that we, I can, right? And you know, they thought they can handle, they can do it. I they can have a good time. Yeah. I want to, but there's consequences yeah. for those uh, actions. All right, we on number two. Go ahead, Miss Karen. Number two is loss of trust. Uh, the people struggling are unlikely to follow through on their agreements or promises, and this causes further strain in their relationships. It's worth noting, however, that most people struggling with substance use disorder usually mean to honor their commitments, but the effects of the substances make them unable to. Thus, if they're in a relationship, their significant other is going to be frustrated due to the um, addict's inability to meet their obligations. They're also likely to forget about the promises they make to their children. If this becomes a trend, the child will have a hard time forming bonds with other people since they don't know how to trust. This loss of trust often results in broken marriages and dysfunctional children. Loss of trust. That is a good one. When you lose the trust of uh, your relationships and your child. My child is my oldest son is 30 he turns 30 or oh, he turns 30 next month actually he turns 30 in october but anyway he's at age 28 and i remember when i was struggling i was making promises i'm gonna do this for you i'm gonna do this for you i'm gonna do this for you and i finally told him yesterday something that was bothering me is because one day i told him i said one day he was coming down the street and he was walking towards me and because I knew I didn't keep my promise, I crossed the street so he wouldn't see me, my own son. He said, Dad, you did that? I said, yeah, I seen you coming and I knew I promised you this. I promised you this. And I was feeling so bad and guilty that I literally crossed the street and avoided seeing my own son. And now that I think about it, what if that was the last time? Wow. I was able to see. Yeah. <laughs> see how it could be selfish? Yeah. What if that would have been the last moment? But when you mess up the trust by promises, it says, they'll also likely forget about the promises they make to their children. You know, you start forgetting, oh, dang, I told him this, I told him this, I told him this, I'm not going to do this no more, I'm not going to do this no more. You know, and that that breaks up or that messes up a uh, trust, a trust issue. Mm -hmm. And then the cycle it repeats itself when they tell you people, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And so, like the bottom, the last sentence says, this loss of trust often results in broken marriages and dysfunctional children. And so, a child would, if not um, addressed right or healed or received proper uh, therapy, often have relationship uh, issues where they can take on a marriage and take those type of behaviors uh not unbeknown to them because they don't have the proper role models and bring it into a marriage <clears throat> or they can have children on them on their own and that's where children having children come in you know, yeah you ever heard of babies yeah. having and babies. babies yeah and that is so true because uh we don't have the proper tools and so that's why we want to address this issue today yeah. because it's so important yeah. we don't want to sound that we're summer, but it's a uh, real issue all our issues that we discuss is real but we need to address this because we got loved ones we got the faith our family and, and our community as a whole thank you miss debbie for your uh comment miss debbie miller appreciate it thank you that's my i'm proud of you too that was my ex-client she's doing well thank you i'll be so happy when i see her and she's doing so good thank you every time i see her i'll be so happy i was like yeah, yeah i was her counselor <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was my <laughs> thank you so much miss debbie all right let's move is on me or, or was on me? increase stress right 
Yeah. Okay, increased stress. In the theories of substance use disorder, the person struggling in is likely going to leave all the responsibility to their partner. You is not lying. The partner therefore becomes the enabler. The enabler. Actually, my wife wasn't an enabler. She was, yeah, she was an enabler. She would take me to treatment after treatment. She said, you ain't got to worry about transportation. I got you. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing she enabled me to do, go to a program. Taking care of bills, making decisions, raising kids, and cleaning up from the substance person with the issue is quickly going to take a toll on the other parent or spouse. This exposes them to an elevated risk of contracting stress-induced conditions such as high blood pressure and anxiety. I can I can attest to that. Uh, my wife was very stressed out during the course of the time. She had uh, a lot of issues going on with uh, her, her daughter and me, and we were all three in the same house. So she was like, I'm over here trying to fix something. I'm over here trying to fix something. But what about me? That's what I asked in the title of her book. I'm sorry. It's called What About Me? But <laughs> yeah. what about me? In addition, people who bottle up their stress are more likely to explode and unleash their emotions all at once. This can cause even more stress and discomfort among family members. Among family members. So when family members uh you it can cause stress among and discomfort among family members. Let me tell you how. It increases the stress in family members because some family members would be like, be done with that person. <laughs> and then they say, Well, why are you still sticking it out? We've done with it. We washed our hands of him. Get out of here. He's never going to end up or she's never going to end up to something. So that causes an increased stress in the whole dynamic of the family. You got one person saying, You know, that person can change and we can stick by them. And then you have some people say, listen, I'm tired of spending all my money and my time invested in this individual. They're never going to get it. It causes stress. And we talked about some of the most serious effects that drug addiction have on the family members. We'd be so focused on the person that has the person that has the substance use disorder that we totally forget about the whole family dynamic. And then some people wonder, those who are uh, incarcerated or those coming out incarcerated, they wonder why they can't return back to their loved ones yeah. because we have caused so much pain and hurt. Damage. And you know, it's called burning bridges. We don't we don't burn so many bridges, and and that leads up to other barriers and things in our community, such as homelessness. You know, when people can't come back home to their uh, loved ones. After being well, coming out of uh, especially incarceration, yeah. because that's a big issue as well. Because drugs, we know, oftentimes leads to other things as well. All right, yeah. let's touch on number four: financial problems. Now, it's one of the, it's one of your specialties here. I don't know about that. Financial uh, expert. Let's, let's talk about it. What's what's going on? Finances <clears throat> and addiction isn't cheap. No, no, no. It isn't cheap. Now I'm talking about money. Cost a lot of money to not only you know maintain that stuff, but also let's see what the article said. Additionally, the substance abuse problem is likely going to cause individuals individual to lose their job due to poor performance or attendance. Now let's stop right there. Pull over, pause, park. Pull over, pause, and park. I got to say it after he said it. But anyway, we try to instill or encourage those who we we help along the way with. Uh, whether it be detox or residential treatment, that it's very important that you go get some help. Let's put it like that. Because we don't want to set you up for failure. Yeah. Most of you you know, they say, oh, man, I, I need a job. Well, if you're still struggling with a substance use disorder, this job ain't going to do nothing. Right. Just like the article said, yeah. you know, poor performance and lack of, of attendance. And so that's very important that we stick with the program and say, hey, listen, whatever's highest on the list. Whatever's highest on the list, address first. All right. When we do the assessment, mm -hmm. we look at the domains, we say, well, this is the highest priority. Let's, let's address that. And so we just want to let you know we're dealing, like Mike said, right before, the six most serious effects of drug addiction on family members. So a lot of times uh, that has a a major role financial problem. After that happens, they'll turn to their savings to quench their 
substance use disorder all the time. Wow. That's why it's important to take care of the higher priorities or or in a stage if you want to list them. If you're still struggling and you're actively using uh, to come to me and say, you know, I need employment. Well, really, if you get the employment, that's true. That is a need. But if you get employment and you're getting more money and you haven't addressed the substance use that you have, you're just going to have more money to get more drugs. So if, if you're honest with yourself, I'm going to be honest with you straight up. It, it, address the, <laughs> address the, the situation first. Because if you get more drugs, it's possible that's more time to attempt to basically kill yourself. Because mm -hmm. that's what drugs its purpose is to try to kill you. Mm -hmm. So it, financial problems are real and they bring burdens on you. Mm -hmm. But address the issue first. Not only you, but it brings right on your family. It says, consequently, the family will begin having problems paying for basic things such as food, clothing, utilities, and rent or mortgage. The reason why they have problems paying those things is because they're using most of their finances trying to help you. Mm -hmm. And when they use most of their main finances helping you, it takes away from the uh, real obligations of the home. Mm -hmm. So you have to realize that. There, there may also be legal problems such as driving under the influence or being caught with drugs, paying your bill. You know, that has happened to me a lot of times. I remember one time, man, uh, I was using drugs, got caught with drugs, and uh, I went to jail, and I needed bail money. <laughs> and so I said, Ma, I need, you know, I, I mom, get, uh, Mama, get, get me. Yeah. You know, but what about all the other people out there in the community that yeah. you say your friends and stuff? So she, don't you know, she took my sister on Christmas money, and I can't she even bail me out. And so that is a true statement yeah. right there. You know, and so the social associated costs create an even bigger financial problem. Enablers might even find provide uh, money for alcohol or drugs to the substance use disorder person to appease them. That happens in a lot of times. Uh, it never personally happened with me, but a lot of times the enabler will do that to try to quiet them down, or you know, people will be crying. Oh, you know, I'm gonna go out here and die if you don't give it to me. And my mom was like, yeah, you definitely gonna die, but it won't be because of my money. <laughs> it, it, but some people aren't strong enough, like my mother and my wife was. They were definitely not giving me money to go get drugs. But people are people are doing that because they're trying to quiet the individual that, that's um, going through something down. Uh, I personally don't recommend it. Uh, you, you're gonna have to figure it out on your own. I wouldn't personally do it for none of my kids. Yeah. Yeah. My mom just said you have to support your own habit. Yeah, big enough to do it, big enough to pay. Yeah, I ain't supporting that. All right. This is not only depleting their finances, it's also making the substance use disorder person think that their family members will always be around to finance their fix. Yeah, once you birth it, you got to always do it. And notice your money is depleting, your rent not getting paid. So you gotta basically toughen up and be kind of strong in that area and realize that you don't feel bad. I think personally, uh, if you providing finances for someone um, that's struggling with a substance use disorder, uh, I don't think, I, I can, I'm not positive, but I don't think the, the conscious mind, your conscious mind will let you sleep if you give them money and they die versus them being out there and dying. Mm -hmm. And you know you gave them that money. And it, I, I think that one will keep you up more than knowing that they were out there and something happened and they died than versus you giving them the money. And you know that money you gave them. Wow. Was, <laughs> yeah. wow. You know, earlier we talked about uh, stress and high blood pressure. Yeah. That would do more damage than that if you know that you would uh, assist uh, with those, the loved ones losing their lives just because you were their neighbor. So how can we help you with your recovery today? And that's a good club right there. Instead of giving them the money, give them our phone number, 856-391-7449 or 1-800-236-244-2448. You can have them call us and we can help them get them into the services they need and possibly change the course of their life forever. So get hooked up with Capital Recovery Center. We are here at uh, 
recovery coaches. My name is Craig, and uh, it's been fun. I don't know if uh, y'all want to keep going or you want to Yeah, we on? can do it. You want to make it on? Yeah. Let's keep going. Let's do five and six. Five and six. Yeah. Physical, uh, number five is physical and emotional abuse. Uh, in addition to making uh, the addict irrational, their substance abuse is also likely to put everyone around them on edge. This means that simple disagreements can result in big fights as everyone feels misunderstood. Mm -hmm. With everyone acting out of character, physical abuse may start occurring on top of the pre-existing emotional abuse. A person struggling can be the perpetrators of abuse, but their vulnerability also puts them at risk of becoming victims of it too. Children of parents who are struggling might also end up becoming abusers as well. In an attempt to shift blame from the addicted parent, some children may end up acting out and misbehaving. These actions can later scar them and cause them to turn to drinking or drug use as their related did as their relative did abuse and addiction can become a deadly cycle that can only be broken by treatment right physical and emotional abuse that's real real too all of these is very good a lot of times like the article said it, it comes from it's learned behavior right behavior you know and so if we instill positive images and positive uh lessons and skills into uh, young people, preferably, they would do the same thing as they grow up. And so, number six talks about fear and confusion. Drug abuse usually makes an individual behaviors unpredictable. You never know how they react to a situation. In a bid to avoid physical or emotional abuse, family members might begin walking or egg on eggshells to appease their substance use disorder loved ones. Wow. And that, that is that is so scary when you know your family member can't have to sleep with one eye open and mm -hmm. one eye closed because of your uh irrational behavior they can't sleep fear and confusion that was me i used to um mm -hmm. i used to never be able to fall asleep or like every little noise startled me <laughs> i'd be like what's going on now mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and walking on Asia is another way too. On the flip side of things, when I would come from treatment and I was walking my recovery process, my wife said she was walking on eggshells because she didn't want to say the wrong thing that could trigger a relapse. So she's like, Dad, do I bring up, you know, what happened? Do I say something? So she's like, I don't know. I don't want something to get into an argument. And now he said, I'm out of here. I'm on. So working, walking on eggshells uh, talks about the fear and the confusion. You like, you know, that's like what I'm going to do, and that's 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 terrible. Yeah, absolutely. You're adjusting your behavior and everything. To appease, it says to appease the person that the the loved one that's struggling. <laughs> you trying to appease them, but you like, nah, we need to address this, but I can't really say nothing. He got like thirty days. <laughs> That's terrible, man. Wow. That's terrible. Or you know what? And what it used to be for me, it was kind of like all that time lost, spending time with family. Yeah. It, it all of a sudden wanted to be crammed in those, you know, 30 days that the person was clean. And I mean, I was a teenager, so I'm like, I don't want to just spend time with you guys. I, I want to go out with my friends. <laughs> yeah. So that would make me feel guilty every time that like I chose to go out with my friends rather than spend time, mm. spend time, you know, with my with my family. That's also like walking on eggshells. Hey, yeah, fear and confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's perfect. All right, all Next right. Part. It said children would become more reserved so as not to risk upsetting the individual. Yeah, <laughs> y'all talked about that's it. it. The end result is a culture or fear and confusion which ensures that the household really has joy. joy. Yeah, when you're walking on eggshells, fear and confusion. So today we was talking about one of the, or the six most serious effects of drug addiction on family members. One was impact of children, loss of trust, increased stress, financial problems, physical and emotional abuse. And last one was fear and confusion. 
So we like to thank all of you guys for tuning in. As always, we'll be here Thursday at 1 p.m. for our all recovery meeting. And please don't forget about uh, the recoveries on wheels tomorrow in violence. All right. All right. We see you guys Thursday.